welcome to this meeting. I'm very glad to see some new faces and also everybody else who I already know. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'm Jona Verwer of the Jewish Art Salon. Um, we organized this series with two co-sponsors who I'll introduce shortly. The Jewish Art Salon is the world's largest Jewish visual art organization. It's established in 2008. We're based in New York City and we're a global network of contemporary artists and scholars. We have organized over 60 exhibitions and art events in the US, Europe and Israel. We provide important programs and resources and develop lasting partnerships with the international art community and the general public. I just want to say a brief word about the current state of affairs in the United States, where we have a lot of unrest. Um, we as Jews stand with the African-American community as we've done time after time um, throughout American history. Both Amer African-Americans and Jews share a history of persecution and racism. Uh, we must continue working together to fight injustice. Um, the Jewish Art Storm has previously collaborated with an organization called the Hol Lashon. It's an organization for Jews of colors, and we've done several exhibitions and panels with them to bring this issue to the foreground. On a personal note, I'm friends with several Jews of color. One of them is a Jewish Art Storm steering committee member, Siona Benjamin, who is originally from India. And over the years, she has told me that there have been sporadic incidents of people making racist comments against her in the Jewish community. Uh, Siona emphasizes, though, that A, she feels that the Jewish art salon has become her family, and B, that she has thrived also in the Jewish community and has many Jewish patrons. So she sees it as her job to educate people who might still be uneducated about this matter. And I think that's like a nice thing to keep in mind for all of us. We will now move on and start the program first with a few words by Esther Margit, who is the founder and director of Art Kibbutz. Esther? Hello, hi everyone. So nice to see all of you here. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, Art Kibbutz and I'm also an advisory board member of the wonderful Jewish Art Salon. Um, Art Kibbutz has worked with the Jewish Art Salon for many, many years. This is our first cooperation with JADA. We are excited to, um, to work with you. Um, we have hosted several artist residency programs this past 10 years. We've been on Governor's Island for many, many years. We worked in partnership with the New Museum and many other outstanding organizations. We usually are not on the presenting side, more um, supporting artists with their process. But now, of course, all of that is up in the air because uh, most of our programs are space based. So um, we are excited to meet you in the virtual space, in the virtual reality. Uh, on the long run, we are working on creating um, artist residency program and we'll see what the future brings uh, with COVID and the unrest and everything else. But um, we now have a steering committee looking into co-housing and co-working options in the New York area. So if anyone is interested in particular in that, please um, find me through Yona or through Facebook and um, I'd be happy to connect you with our group. And um, I'm excited to hear about the speakers today and uh, see their virtual studios today. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Esther. Um, Jonathan, would you like to say a few words? Sure, Yona, thank you so much. First of all, um, it's a great pleasure to say that uh, being with the Jewish Art Salon and Art Kibbutz, uh, it's a great pleasure, this is incredibly important. JADA is an organization that's uh, incredibly grass, grassroots, started last year, and uh, we have already put together a good number of uh, art events, including artist residence programs. This year we are launching our JADA Art Journal, which will publish um, articles and artwork that deals with the matter modern. We promote and cultivate the matter modern, which we believe that especially the Jewish art world is uh, becoming more and more part of it. So thank you so much one more time for inviting me to be here, Yona and Archibus. Thank you so much, Yonatas. Um, okay, I'd like to introduce the first artist presenting. Um, Ruth Simon McRae is a Jewish visual artist living in Taylorsville, Georgia. 
She works in a range of disciplines, painting, printmaking, mixed media and ceramics, as well as textiles. And I'm very happy to meet her here because I've never met her in person. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you, Ruth. The floor is yours, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you to the Jewish Art Salon for the opportunity to present my work. Today, I'm going to show a series of handmade tallit. There are 18 total tallit in the T-Ferret series. My process for making the tally tote is very much like painting using fabric, stitching, and hand-painted imagery as my tools. Excuse me for a moment. But we're having a bit of a, oh no. My apologies. Are we still on share screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna to have to, to drive from here. <laughs> I'd like to start by showing you a bit of how I got to this work. Inspired by the work of Romar Bearden, I started adding fabrics to my paintings. This quickly evolved to making the entire piece with textile materials, stitching into fabric that had been stretched like canvas. Here are three of my favorites. On the left, Memories of Shirley was made after my mother died, using fabrics and imagery that reminded me of her. That's actually one of my blouses uh, as the dominant fabric. I built this piece slowly over a long period of time. On the right is blue, my most recent textile collage. It is the most painterly and the most abstract. Blue also uses stitching as a key component of the piece. Lace drawing is an earlier work from about five years ago that explores texture and transparency. One of my favorite things about it is the way the lace creates a shadow on itself towards the top. It also features a fragment of a brocade paisley fabric. Stitching and ribbon embellishment are important parts of this piece. So now we're on to the actual tally tote. I began making tally tote in a, in a stroke of serendipity. A friend and I had been doing a lot of textile printing and dyeing experiments, turning our trials into things like scarves and table runners. My cousin, who is a Jewish educator, suggested that some of the handmade textiles I was making reminded her of Tali Tote. I decided to make the initial Tali Tote based on themes from my life. I live in the country in a very small town in Georgia, surrounded by hills, farmland, and trees. This first one, the trees tallit, was inspired by the experience of sitting in my backyard at dawn, looking up at the sky through the trees. Leaning back in my chair, I took a photograph of the branches against the sky. The fabrics used include a silk screen I made by cutting and pasting that image in combination with the stencil design of abstracted tree branches. This shows you the original silkscreen image and also how the fabric of the tallit is laid out along its length. Here is the tallit inspired by our garden. The teal fabric at the bottom is a resist dyed indigo over a bright green linen base, which makes it, gives it that jade green color. The body of the tallit is stenciled in a subtly gradated color palette. The tallit is lined with silk. Most of the fabrics in this collection, with the exception of some of the silk linings, are dyed by hand. I want to mention something here about the tzitzit, all of which are hand tied. After researching the shotness issue with my rabbi, we determined what type of tzitzit needed to go on the various combinations of fiber. This tallit, for example, has linen tzitzit. The fabric for the watercolor tallit is made with a shibori technique and multi-hued dyeing. Shibori is a method of resist dyeing using folding and tying the fabric to resist against penetration of the dye. The shibori fabric here is matched up with an end-on-end -end tweed linen that looks almost iridescent 
and a periwinkle china silk for the linen, for the lining, excuse me. This is my personal tallit. It is made with vintage lace, embroidery, and a patchwork of different fabrics. What I like about wearing a tallit is that it gives me a private space to pray or meditate. It creates almost a cocoon. I don't always wear one in shul. I actually like wearing this at home. I like how my tallit can be iterative, how it can evolve over time. Every time I wear this, I think about new ways, things I would like to change and things I would like to add. This vintage linen tallit is made from my grandmother's pillowcase, which was one of the first fabrics that I hand dyed. It has a multi-hue shibori dyed atara and is lined, lined with an ikat dyed silk from India. The corners are made from vintage handkerchiefs dyed to a complementary soft gray green color. This tallit is reversible. The burnished tallit is block printed using an antique wood block from India on a gold textured silk. It is paired with a blue-green silk that was printed with tiny stars in copper, pewter, and gold colors. The tallit also is reversible to a print cotton, you can see that sort of peeking out, that is trimmed with more of the star patterned fabric. And this shows you both sides, different sides of the tallit. On a completely different note, this bright pink linen multicolor tallit has a simplified and stylized flower design and has decorative corners created with a mandala type block print. Making this was almost a palette cleanser to the earlier work. Here are three different tallit totes that are made with roughly the same techniques. The theme for each is the emotion that can be generated by color. Each started with a multi-hue dyed textile, which was partnered with another fabric that could make it sing. The tallit on the right, Color Flow, is certainly the boldest of the series. The patterned fabric is centered against a rust brick colored silk ray on velvet. Here is a more formal and elegant white on white tallit. The gorgeous textured brocade fabric is emphasized with silver and gray accent embroidery, and it's trimmed with some fancy silk ribbons. And here is a simple and classic tallit. Grow grain ribbon was sewn on by hand as applique, creating stripes of varying widths. The Atara features a mid-century inspired geometric design. This tallit is reversible to an ikat dyed silk. And this is the 18th tallit, which is not yet finished. I thought I would end this presentation with a look to the future. I'm still deciding what kind of fabric to use and to make for lining this tallit. I'm thinking of a cream colored silk printed with a layered lace pattern in a very soft color contrast and possibly sewing thin brown velvet ribbon and tiny lace ribbon on the front to create a bit more detail. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Next is Lori Wall's presentation. So in my unweaving fiber art pieces, I can convey spiritual narratives through form, color, texture, and calligraphy. Over the years, I've become increasingly affected by the words and music of the Kabbalat Shabbat service, the receiving, the welcoming of the Sabbath, which was a ritual composed by the 16th century mystics of Safad. Lori, you too have the slides on oh, right. where you can, yeah, slideshow, just click on slideshow. Oops. Okay, I think we're okay now. Yep, thanks. Oops. Okay. Don't know what that was. The 12 pieces in the Shabbat project interpret and embed Shabbat prayers that have per particular resonance for me through the music that carries them. 
The music calls forth the heart of the prayers. I unweave with my hands, feeling the sound and substance of these prayers. And by creating symbolic forms, incorporating Hebrew texts, and using my own narrative iconography in response to these prayers, I create a visual interpretation, a visual midrash. Thinking in this way has opened up a path into thinking more closely about the relationship of text, sound, and visualization of prayer. How do we pray? What helps us to pray? What comes after prayer? As many of you know, 16th century Safad in the Galilee in Israel was the center of Jewish mysticism, or Kabbalah. Isaac Luria was the foremost rep, uh, rabbi and most influential interpreter of Kabbalah in 16th century Safad. He prescribed this Friday evening ritual. Go out into an open field, turn your face toward the west where the sun sets, and at the very moment that it sets, direct your concentration so as to receive the special holiness of the Sabbath. Begin by reciting the psalm, give to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Following this, recite three times, come, O bride, come, O bride, O Sabbath queen. After more psalms, he continued, then open your eyes and return home, enter and wrap yourself in a fringed prayer shawl. In time, Kabbalat Shabbat was standardized to consist of six psalms and the hymn L'cha Dodi. The service opens with Lahu Naranana, Psalm 95, followed by Psalms 96 through 99 and Psalm 29, building up to L'cha Dodi, after which Psalms 92 and 93 are recited. As seen by the mystics, our journey toward Shabbat is the journey of moving from exile to redemption, from this world to the world to come. With the music of the Kabbalat Shabbat service, we mark the transition from profane to sacred. With this background, let's look more closely at my engagement with the Kabbalat Shabbat prayers, my visual midrash. Let's enter the sanctuary here and listen to a bit of this nigun that begins our celebration. <laughs> With the semi-transparent materials and the circular form here, I hope to evoke the mystery and beauty of the, Sh of the Shabbat bride as expressed in the Hadodi. The opening words embodied the imagery of the Shabbat bride. Let's listen. <laughs> There are references to many other prayers and melodies embedded in this piece, including Lahu Naranana, Ma God Lu and Tov La Adot, Ahavat Olam, Yidi Nefesh, and Shiru Ladonai Shir Hadash. Exalt and the next piece, Romamu, echo the form of the Talit that Ruth's work also places at the center of Shabbat. They respond to Psalm 99. Romamu Adonai Eloheinu Vehishtakavu Lahar Kadsho Ki Kadosh Adonai Eloheinu Romamu. Let us exalt Adonai our God and worship at his holy hill, for holy is Adonai. Let us exalt. Let's listen. Romamu Adonai Eloheinu Vehishtakavu Lahar Kadsho Romembo 
Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote, prayer is a perspective from which to behold, from which to respond to the challenges we face. How can we hope to gain this perspective through synagogue prayer ritual? For many of us, the tunes separate from the words serve as a portal to the past. For many Jews who do not understand Hebrew, the tune is the prayer. Music amplifies the emotions in the prayer text. Praise, glory, happiness, joy, sorrow, lament, yearning. We know from David's Psalms that music historically has been a way of communicating with Adonai. Music transcends the literal meaning of the words. As one congregant has put it, I might not remember individual words, but I carry the melody, the feeling with me throughout the day. Call Adonai responds to Psalm 29. Call Adonai al Hamayim, Adonai al Mayim Rabim. The voice of Adonai is upon the waters, Adonai is upon many waters. Let's listen. The unwoven river form of the piece also responds to the beautiful water imagery found in Psalms 93 and 98. For example, from Psalm 93, from the noise, the sound of many waters, more powerful than breakers, than waves of the sea. Suggesting a wing shape, messengers of peace interprets the familiar words of the poem Shalom Aleichem, a piyut composed by the Kabbalists in the 17th century. Peace scroll contains words from very familiar prayers, Shalom Rav, Sim Shalom, and Oseh Shalom. Recalling Rabbi Luria's prescription to return home after the ritual in the field and to wrap ourselves in our talit, with Hashkivenu we leave the sanctuary. Hashkivenu is an ancient prayer from Seder Rav Amram, our first known comprehensive prayer book from about 860 of the Common Era. Hashkivenu Adonai Eloheinu l'shalom, Bahamidenu shamrenu l'chayim, Ufros Alenu Sukat Shlomecha. Cause us to lie down in peace and raise us up our sovereign to life renewed and spread over us the shelter of your peace. <laughs> I hope that I've given you a taste of the power of Kabbalat Shabbat, how music partners with and calls forth prayer, and how our understanding of prayer and our feel for it can be enhanced both by music and by visual interpretation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. And I apologize, I did not introduce you. So would you allow me to now, after the fact, sure. <laughs> tell the, the, the audience of your accomplishment? So New York City-based fiber artist Lori Wall is internationally known for her unique unweavings, liturgical projects, and interfaith message. Her works are held in the collections of the Museum of Art and Design, the American Bible Society, the Constitutional Court of South Africa, amongst others, and have been on loan to U.S. embassies in Beirut, Vienna, Tunis, Cape Town, and Pretoria. So thank you, Laurie. These were great. Um, so a lot of people already put in the chat that they have questions. So we're now going to open it up to questions for now to either Ruth or Laurie. Unmute yourself, please, Elizabeth, and ask the question. Thank you very much. Uh, 
beautiful works. Uh, two questions for Lori. One is, what are the little figure symbol that uh, appear in her artwork symbolizing? And number two, what does she mean by unweaving? Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, the iconography is one that I've developed over the years. Um, they represent praying figures, journeying figures, um, birds, um, processional figures, and the like. It's just a symbol uh, system that I've developed over, over many years. And what was the um, second question again? What is unweaving? Oh, unweaving. What do you mean? Right. I take canvas and I remove either the warp or weft threads to make different shapes. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Reggie Soncino has the next question. Hi. Well, I already wrote it in the chat that I saw it in Sag Harbor and the room was just beautiful and it sh I was there for the Shabbaton, I guess the opening of your exhibit. So it was just so special. Um, I really, really loved it. Okay, question. I, I want to do a workshop. I want to come to you for a workshop. Do you do workshops? I do do workshops. We'll have to figure it out. Thank that you. That would be great. Thank you. Rena, please ask your question. I know that you just, I just heard you say that your pieces, Lori, are made out of canvas. Are the colored threads also those canvas threads? Yes, I, st I start with regular artist canvas. It's a 12 ounce cotton canvas, which unweaves beautifully. It's a very densely woven fabric. Um, and that's what I take apart, basically. And I, um, I unweave before I do anything else. And then the uh, surface is painted. All the threads are painted with many thin layers of paint with an um, interference gold wash over the surface at the end. Do so what you, I, what do I you can see of acrylic? my- uh, It's acrylic paint, yeah. And um, I can think of it really as taking the fabric apart so that you can see what's inside it. So it's as if all the colors actually were inside it, but the process is the reverse. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your technique and your work. Both, both of the presentations were really beautiful. Thank you. Um, does someone have a question or a statement for Ruth McRae? So I'm going to call on Bonnie Astor, not knowing who she has a question for. Why oh, there yes. Is. So um, the, my, uh, my question was, uh, I, I, I missed the first artist, so sorry about that. But my question is about why did, was the voice over the artworks male rather than female? How was that decided? Um, that was decided because it was the music of uh, the cantor from my synagogue, which is Stephen Weiss Free Synagogue in New York. And the voice is cantor Dan Singer. And usually we have the congregation is all singing al along. It wouldn't be just Dan, but he recorded uh, the music for me. And um, we have a very close relationship and that's why that's why it's Dan. Thank you, loved your work. And very, the, uh, it, it makes I, me miss spot. It makes me want to go there right now, well, yes. And I also wanted to uh, say the Kol Adonai uh, snippet that you heard, Dan composed that, uh, that piece himself. And he's just come out with a book called Tapestry of Prayer, which is all the music that he's composed for Kabbalat Shabbat and many other things. And the uh, book is illustrated by my unweavings for the Shabbat project. Wonderful. Congratulations, Mazel tov. Joel Silverstein has a question. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, I want to compliment both artists. The, the work was really, really beautiful and and um, kind of evocative of so much. Um, I have a question for Laurie. Um, hi, Laurie. How are you doing? Hi, Joel. Hi. Okay. Um, you mentioned music and voice and prayer. Um, you know, words and prayer. When I look at your work, I really think of architecture. I think of, and I specifically, what's interesting to me is kind of like the the um, architecture that we don't have anymore, you know, Jewish architecture, like weavings in the Mishkan, that kind of thing, which are described, uh, you know, in the Torah and the Jewish writings. Um, do you think of other art forms besides those that you mentioned? Um, 
I mean in terms of incorporating it in my own work or just in general? For inspiration, because you know, you mentioned specifically, you know, like I said, prayer and music, but I look at your work and first of all, your use of those bead things are so mathematically precise <laughs> and so architectural that they, again, they evoke kind of like, for, for me as a Jew, it's kind of like ancient Jewish art that doesn't exist anymore. So I, I've always been drawn to your work. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, it, a lot of it is architectural in terms of like the dome shapes, the window kinds of things. And that's the sacred architecture generally, um, whether, with, uh, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, uh, Islam, um, there are common architectural forms. And of course that has inspired the shapes that I use. Thank you. Okay, we have one more uh, time for one more question now. We can have more questions later. Julia Reimer Brooker. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Good to see you again on a Sunday morning. Um, I, both of your works are just incredible. I did have some technical questions for Ruth, um, since I'm starting to get into fabric dyeing myself. Um, I was curious for two things, just in terms of quickly with Shibori, if you mentioned it's multiple colors. I'm wondering if you're dipping when you're doing the shibori, if you're using like multiple dye baths or if it's like over time, kind of how that's working with that technique. What I'm using is ice to disperse the colors. So I'm doing it all at one time. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. yeah and okay. in depositing the dye all at one time and then as the ice melts um, over about 12 hours, it deposits it on the fabric. Okay, cool. Um, and then secondly, you'd briefly mentioned getting around the shotness yes. issue. I was wondering if you could just talk just quickly a little more about that. Well, as, as we know, shotness is the prohibition against combining linen and wool. And most um, seat seat that you buy are either hand, hand, um, sp hand spun or machine spun wool. So if I just buy seat seat to work with I can't put wool on a linen right. um, garment. There are two issues. One is that a tallit isn't really clothing. So, so that's the first kind right. of workaround, but that's yeah. not where I went with it. What I did was if, if there was linen, I made them out of linen. Okay. And if um, I have one that's silk, I'm making it out of silk. So I'm, I'm trying to, to really marry the, the tzitzit to the proper fiber. Is that, is that a... Yeah, that, that I just, yeah, just a little more technical questions about some of your, your work, and mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, Beautiful work. So our next presenter is Alan Holtzblatt. Um, Alan creates paintings and drawings to explore connections between the physical <laughs> and the spiritual, the memories of the body that resides in the soul. Holtzblatt, the Chicago-based <laughs> artist, um, exhibits nationally and internationally, including the Jerusalem Biennale, the Museum of Biblical Art in New York, and the Insel Gallery in Berlin. Holtzblatt has degrees in visual art and art therapy from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm also going to time myself, so because sometimes when I start talking, I think everything will take me about like three minutes to say, and then half hour later, I'm not even there yet. So um, we will work on that. But anyway, I really appreciate you being here. And um, I'm, in talking about my work, I have to also be personal um, because my work is very personal to me. Um, I don't really separate out who I am, what I do, what I experience, what I feel, you know, my spiritual life, everything comes through in my work, in, whether it's conscious or unconscious. I feel when it's unconscious, it's actually more honest. So I call this my journey as an artist, but it's actually my journey as an artist from maybe the last 15 years. Um, in the beginning part of my journey as an artist, I started my very first memory of being an artist is when I was two and I swallowed half a paintbrush. And I like to think that's my per personal mythology that I actually internalized one of the tools of my, of my craft. But um, I'm not gonna like fill you in from two to 50. So we will like move on beyond that. Um, so when I was about after, you know, I got my degree and I, I ended up going to college. I got my degree in fine arts. I became an art therapist, but everything changed with, um, with every year as I became a parent 
and um, suddenly my studio went from being the living room to a bedroom to an enclosed porch to a little area in the basement to pretty much the dining room table. So everything started to change. And at some point when my kids started to get older um, and I started to realize what a lack I had in my life, not that I wasn't making art, it's just that it wasn't central and it was really impacting me. Um, I started to make it more central again. Um, and so that's why I, in the description of this, I talked about how I'm an artist, but the fact that I'm a woman and all the experiences that I go through as a woman, um, the experiences that I go through as being Jewish, whatever other label I can throw, all impact everything that I do. I can't separate those things from myself. So I'm going to start with when I started really spending a lot of time making art again, and I didn't have a studio. Um, I wasn't painting. I didn't feel like I could paint because I, I, I'm an oil painter. I will always be an oil painter. Um, it, I didn't really have a place that I felt like it was safe in my house to bring that in with my family around. I started doing woodcut prints. And one of the first series that I did was called Hamabul. Um, it's a series that I, I exhibited at the Museum of Biblical Art. Um, Matthew Beigel has very kindly written about this series, which was, I really, really appreciated. Um, but where it became, where it began was really a very personal thing. I was very interested in the story of Noah, but not so much about Noah. I was really interested in the death and the destruction. Um, what was going on in my life at that time was that I think I was personally going through some things. I was going through menopause. Um, I was really searching for what it meant for me to be an artist and to be a parent, to be a daughter of aging, par of, of aging parents and fitting all those things in and feeling immersed and deluged by everything that was going on in my life and all the responsibilities. So Hamabul came about because I was really thinking about the death, the destruction. We don't talk about those things in the Bible. The Bible is very, very spare. All the stories don't really go into a lot of detail. I started to fill in those details. But what happened in these images is that I started to move beyond the destruction and I started to move into the realm of what was actually happening on the ark. What was happening with those residents? What did that mean? What did this whole story really mean? Um, I still don't have that answer. And that is why we continue to read this every year and we continue to debate it because there is not one right answer. But I started to find answers for me. And um, the residents of the ark started to become um, fetuses and the ark became a womb. And so that meant that everything that was happening around this, this deluge, this undoing of creation, um, this, this blurring of the boundaries between the heavens above and the heavens below, and what that means, the destruction that comes from that. But there was this safe place, there was this ark, and the, that's when they became fetuses. Uh, this was Noah, and so the waters can be amniotic fluids, which were surrounding Noah, and by the way, in this, it talks about how he was 600 years old. I don't know what 600 means. I doubt that he was actually 600 years old. So what do, is it 60? Is it, what does that mean? So to me, it became a fetus who was six months old, and I worked with that image. But then, so you have the calming amniotic fluids, but then that's still the destructive forces of the waters of the flood around him. Um, and again, the fetuses. And ultimately, this series led me to the final um, image, which is so long as earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Um, and again, bringing me, I, I had two daughters, I nursed each of them for three years. I spent six years of my life um, as a conduit of, of food. I was their lovey, um, all those different things. But all these things kind of came together for me. And I continued then after that to work on another book, another series, and this is called Sefer Chana. Um, personally, going back again a little bit, when my oldest daughter was three years old, I was pregnant. I was living in a small town in Illinois called Woodstock, and um, I was working at the synagogue as the newsletter. I, I did the newsletter. And I was at the synagogue by myself that day. And while I was there, 
It was between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur with my daughter. I had a miscarriage at the synagogue. And I feel very sorry for the woman at Yom Kippur services who turned around during services and looked at me and said, oh, I just heard the great news, congratulations. Um, and I burst into tears and ran out and I had to talk to her afterwards about it. It wasn't her fault, she didn't know because some news travels really fast and some news doesn't travel as fast. But that time of life, that time of year is really very fraught and meaningful for me. And I love the story of Kana. It's something that I chant every year on Rosh Hashanah. Um, it's a story that I think really is a woman's story. And I'm really glad that in my synagogue that it is chanted by a woman. Um, there aren't a lot of stories that tell the you know really personal story of women in the Bible. So that one, took on a lot of meaning for me. And a year later, I did have another child. I had a daughter and I named her Hana. So that's, these are images from that book. There's actually only six images in the book. Um, I'm showing you three of them. Um, Hana and she, you know, she spoke with her heart. And then just briefly, just sharing this last uh, woodcut that I did. This was for the woman of the book, it's Tazria. Um, definitely on theme for me, I was dealing with, with infants, with fetuses, with birth, the whole connection of birth and death and how that all those things can be conveyed in a woman's body. Um, and the seven birds represent the seven days of creation. So what I really wanted to do, I'm doing these woodcuts, and I love doing the woodcuts, but I really wanted to paint. I'm a painter. I've always been a painter. I love paint. I love the feel of it. I love the, the movement of it. Um, but it wasn't happening, and I, um, I don't know if any of you can experience that or have experienced this, but fear of what you love most is something that I have experienced, and I finally, I was at a residency that a, um, a friend of mine invited me to come live in her studio for a week in Indiana. Um, she had a bedroom and a bathroom, and it was really, really lovely. But I started painting, and it was like this momentous thing, this momentous occasion. So this was actually on Shabbat evening, um, and I think I called it Shabbat evening. Did I? Hold on a minute. I've got the title somewhere. Yes, Sabbath evening. And then the next morning, so that was just, there was no color. There was really no color, but it was a painting. It was paint. And then the next day, it was Sabbath morning. And then the next day, we had after Sabbath. And that was the beginning for me because once I started painting, I could continue painting. Um, there's always that, that fear of the blank canvas and it's something that I have somehow managed to move beyond at different points in my life, thank God. So I also wanted to, at, at the same time a lot of this was happening when I was 50 years old, um, my father passed away, and he passed away on my birthday, my 50th birthday, which is always going to be another defining moment in my life. Um, and it connects us in a very, very meaningful way. I mean, not that we weren't connected, but the day that he stopped living happened to be on the anniversary of the day that I started living on this, on this earth. But I started finally, um, it took me a few years, but I had always kind of wanted to work with that image, with those, with those feelings, with that experience. And I started a series called Yizker. You know, I, had a, I had a year, I spent my 11 months, I said Kaddish every single day for my father. Um, and I remember my first Yizker was momentous. This one is called Days as Grass. It is uh, 42 by 60. And it is actually the only painting that I've sold that I don't own that I actually miss. Usually I'm like, it's fine that they can go away because it's all about the process and I start my next painting. But this painting I actually do miss. Um, and then I started working with my, my mother is still alive. This is a painting of my mother and my father. It's called In the Refuge of the Most High. And um, my mother actually was like, the series is called Yisker. Why am I in these paintings? So she has a point, but it's not just about memory of people who aren't here. It's really about memory of what I either, memories of things I've experienced, memory of things I haven't experienced that still strongly influence me. You know, I am influenced by the fact that my father's father was put in an orphanage when, he, when his father died, even though his sister was allowed to continue to live with her family. And I, you know, 
and I remember seeing my my father cry over the fact that two brothers died when they were infants, that he had two brothers who died when they were infants. And all those memories that I didn't personally experience are still a part of who I am. So that's, Yusker started to be a little bit about that. Um, this is another one, my mother looked at this painting. She said, you know, I remember getting married, but I don't remember all those dead birds on the table. And so, and again, she does have a point, but I, I, birds are very symbolic for me, um, and I really do love the image of them. And it's not just that they're dead, it's, it's not really about being dead. It's about, again, about the beginning and the ending and how all things are connected. And there are seven birds. Um, I use a lot of different numbers, which have, are meaningful to me, and seven, of course, is creation. And this is another one of my mother. And we're gonna, since I'm talking about my mother, put a pin in this because there's gonna be more about my mother later. That's very Jewish, right? Thinking about your mother? Okay. Um, so this is a painting of my mother when she was a child. And there's very few photographs of my mother. Um, I don't think she had a happy life. There was one time she was over and I said, Mom, why don't you tell me a story of your childhood? And she said, my parents didn't love each other. And I think that was, I, you know, and I know, I know that's true because my grandmother told me she didn't love her husband. So, um, but you know, how does that impact somebody? How does that get passed on through the generations when you have those types of experiences? Um, but this was, my mother just always looked sad in pictures and she looked older than she was. When I was, I, at some point in my life, um, when, uh, when my father was still alive actually, so quite a while ago, I just I made a decision to go back to school and I got a master's in special ed. Um, and I was working in a high school on the south side of Chicago and I wasn't um, particularly happy. It wasn't really a good fit for me. There were a lot of, part of the is that it was just long, long hours. There were a lot of problems within the school itself. It was a huge commute. I was away from my family. My daughters were in high school. So I had this memory, I had this moment with my youngest daughter, we were in bed and she was talking about how afraid she was of getting a job one day. I was like, what are you afraid of? And she said, well, I see how unhappy you are. It was a really strong moment for me because it made me realize I thought I was doing something for my family. I was helping to contribute. I was you know, making an income, helping to save towards college. But I have two daughters and I had to really rethink what I was modeling for them. And that was one of the things that really led me to making art my full-time career again, because it is what feeds my soul. And I want them in their lives, and they know this, to choose the things that feed their soul. Obviously you have to feed your body too. And I'm very fortunate that I don't have to worry about that at this stage in my life. But I also want them to think about what gives them passion. This is it, this is all the time that we have. So this painting is of my daughter. After she went to college, by the way, she, um, we dropped her off in the dorm. I tried to make her bed for her. She would not even let me make her bed. She could not wait to get us out of her dorm room and go out there and meet people and live her life. God bless her. So this, when I came home, this is called, um, um, I bore you on eagle's wings and, um, it's about my feelings about being, not having my daughters living with me anymore, that they're out in their life, they're, they're doing what I wanted them to do, but they are not here. And I I'm grateful for every moment I have that they let me in so I can be a part of their lives. This was a, a self-portrait. This is a transitional painting. It's called, um, um, excuse me, I have let you see it. I have let you see it with your own eyes. And it references Moses um, when he wasn't being allowed to enter Israel. He was only allowed to see it from a distance. I thought about that and how so much of my life has been just sitting back and looking and not participating. And I was making a decision to want to be part of the landscape, to be part of the earth, to be in the world, to be doing the things that I want to do, um, the things that are important to me, the things that that feed my life, and hopefully. If I'm doing that, then that contributes then to, to the universe, to the positives in the universe as well. So that's really what this painting was about. And I started then doing landscapes because once I made that decision that I was going to be 
doing that, that I was not going to be looking at the promised land from a distance, that I was going to walk in that promised land, that meant painting landscapes because landscapes for me became an emotional connection to, they, they're, um, they're a metaphor for everything else that's going on in my life or in, in the world that um, I'm attracted to certain things that, that feed my soul. And they're not necessarily the things that will feed someone else's soul. I'm not really looking for the be beautiful blue skies and the sunny days, um, hate hot weather, <laughs> but um, it's more, I, I, and it's not something I can necessarily describe, but it's, it's, I, see, I know it when I see it. So this is from a residency that I had at um, Ragdale in Lake Forest in Illinois. And they have the prairie, it was in the fall. Um, it was from a stormy day and everything was changing because when you're in that kind of day, the light is constantly changing. So I call this under the sun because it comes from Ecclesiastes, um, from Kohelet. And I'm thinking of the elements of Adama and Shemesh and Havel and how, especially Havel, I'm thinking about, it's often translated as vanity, but really means breath. And you think about breath. I read this beautiful essay um, online where it talked about breath as something when you think on a cold day and you can see your breath and then it's, you can see it, it exists and then it dissipates. Um, so I wanted to take the, to try to describe that by taking different elements from the same experience and then um, having them become a whole, even though they weren't really connected in the physical world when I observed them. This one is 40 by 90 inches. This is another one that follows the same thing. This is from a, a residency that I had in Iceland. And uh, this is called, There is Nothing So Whole as a Broken Heart. This one is a little different. Um, this is an unusual one. I did this for a show at the Evanston Art Center that was curated by Dorit jordan Jotun, and um, which I'm very grateful that she curated me into the show. It's called The Wind Passes Over It and It Is Gone. And it really had to deal with the, the artificiality of borders and which seems to be a theme, I think, in a lot of my work that, that things are really come together and they're connected, um, even though they seem like they're very separate. And this was about Israel and about the, the border and the separation between the people and the land and that we create this illusion that things are separate when they're really, when they're really not as separate as we, as we think they are. Um, this is, a, I started a series called Destroyed Worlds. Um, I'm just gonna kind of quickly go through this because I wanna get sort of to the end. So I'm not gonna really talk about those. Okay, here. I only have a few minutes left, so I wanted to discuss some of the paintings. I remember I said, put a pin in my mother. Don't actually put it in my mother, but um, pin into the idea of my mother. So in the last year, I've started doing a series of portraits about her. This is called, um, this is called Like a Lily Among Thorns. It's 60 by 30. Um, three of the paintings are titled from Shira Shirim, which I specifically chose because I wanted to think about um, giving a, elevating the work through title. Like I can either be descriptive with a title or I can elevate into a different place. And I thought about the sensuality of it and how we don't normally think of a 97 year old woman when we think about that, that particular text but it's really beautiful, it's, it's physical, it's sensual, spiritual and metaphorically, and I wanted to connect that with her. Um, and then this one is called My Beloved. And when I started this, that's a pelican. Um, I, many years ago I was in San Diego and I was fascinated by the pelicans and I finally found a place to bring one into one of my paintings. And this one is called um, Love is as Fierce as Death. It started out as a landscape. I just was not feeling that and it ended up becoming a painting of my mother. The last one I'm gonna show you, um, and then I will I'll just talk about it very briefly. This is a painting I'm currently working on. Um, I am not quite sure if I'm finished or not. I probably am but I started it actually about six or seven years ago. Was not happy with it, sitting in my studio. Then about three years ago, I decided to rework it and it became something else. 
Um, and then uh, for the last year, I've been looking at it and rethinking about it. There was something compelling about this image that I felt like I needed to address. I'm not sure why there's red on my screen, but um, anyway, but it became something, it started to become something else again. And it's a painting of my mother. The body is mine, the hands are mine. Uh, the landscape, um, the, the thing that interested me the most about it really was the transition between sky and the earth. And this is called The Earth Was Wild and Waste. Um, and I think that it sort of came back, I was thinking about it this morning, what it was about this painting, how I started with Hamabul and the flood and the, the blurring between the heavens above and the heavens below. And this painting, I feel like that's starting to happen again. Um, in a very different format. But I was really interested in how the sky was coming to the earth and there was this blurring between the two. Um, and those boundaries don't exist in some ways that I don't want to paint sky and view it differently necessarily than I, than I view earth. I think that they're all connected for me. So anyway, I am uh, very grateful that I'm gonna unshare my screen now and um, thank you very, very much for for being here and um, letting me speak with you and share my work. I really appreciate it. I want to thank you, Alan, because it was really a great presentation. And all three of you presenters have such exquisite technique and all very different, but I'm so taken by it. You have a lot, there are a lot of people who commented in the chat room. If you'd like to ask Alan a question, please you know, go to the participants um, window at the bottom and click on the raise hand and I will uh, call upon you. While people are doing that, I also wanted to um, mention you had brought up uh, Dorit Jordan Dotan. I hope she's still on the meeting because she was earlier. Um, she is someone we all owe a lot to. Uh, first of all, she designed uh, the first graphic that we had for this series. Um, she also has been curating several exhibitions and she will be talking about one of them that she did in Berlin recently. Um, I think it's two Sundays from now. So anyway, let's see who has been raising hands. Amy Rubin. Amy, please unmute yourself. <laughs> Hi there. That was just beautiful work all, all three of, to all three of the presenters and, and Elena, it was just so beautiful. And um, I'm kind of struck by um, your theme of motherhood, and if I can just share a, a tiny story. Uh, when I became a parent and I was working as an artist and so much of the materials I was working with were dangerous and just not easy to interrupt, and so I had to make the shift. And I'd applied for a grant to kind of explore that theme. And the feedback I got back was that the work was strong, the idea was cute, but that they didn't see the universal application. And so that's why it was rejected. And um, I, was, I was really furious about that. And I'm curious about um, the reception of your work and um, how you have balanced your identity as a, a mother and an artist during, during that period. During which period? The, the period when you were making the work, um, uh, that initial transition. I, and um, before, if, if I, I, I cried a lot. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I, I'm not very good at balance. So that's like someone you should, you should ask somebody else about that. I tend to, I tend to not do that. Well, I, I just kind of react to things and do the best that I can. I figure like if I'm, if I'm a caring mother, that's all that I can do if I love my kids and, and I'm imperfect. Oh, well. So, but as far as the reception from the rest of the world, um, or the art world, I think some people are interested in the story and some people are not. And I actually had somebody at a, at a recent art talk say, art, artist talk say, you know, I, I'm just happy looking at the work. You don't have to tell me the story. It's like, yeah, but I'm doing an artist talk. So I have to say something. So you're, this is what you're going to get. Um, yeah, I, it, sometimes you, you know, you're leaving yourself vulnerable and you have to be ready for the fact that not everyone's going to be open to it. My guess is that was a man who said that, or maybe not, but, um, I, I can't think of anything that's less, that's more universal than the concept of, of, you know, of the continuation of life and how we are all involved in this and that cycle. So thank you for sharing that. 
Okay, I don't see any other hands, but there are a lot of people I made comments in the chat. Oh, I do see hands, I'm sorry. Dorit! Dorit, please unmute yourself. Okay, I'm here. Hello to everybody. Uh, Ellen, that was wonderful as usual. I love your work. It's so amazing. It just filled me up with so much joy just to see it. And I wanted to talk about your birds that are appearing in all the, in most of the paintings, in all kinds of, uh, you know, sometimes they look like they're just lying there, dead, and sometimes they're flying, but they're existing. Uh, you want to tell about it? Yeah, I am, a, I have, I'm not currently because I don't have birds now, but in the past I was officially a member of the flock. So that was like one of my biggest honors in life. I used to have parakeets and they were like little people to me. They would fly me, we would have conversations. Unfortunately, my last one just died in December and I just can't deal with the fragility of it anymore. But um, so I have a, I've had birds as pets since I was a child. I have a very natural connection to them, but I also find the shape of them very beautiful. Um, I used to go to the Field Museum in Chicago, the, they used to, I, I had a connection with someone there who would let me come into the back where they have all the cabinets with all the drawers of, filled with birds. And I would go back there, it was really incredible, and be able to draw them and photograph them. And I did a lot of work from them. So, but I also think they're really symbolic. You know, they live on, they live on the, in the sky, they live on the earth, they live in the water. They really um, transcend all those different boundaries that I was talking about transcending. Great, thank you. Um, Richard McBee has a question. Richard, unmute yourself. So, wow, uh, what a presentation, all three of you. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a little something to say about everybody, but um, Ellen, you, uh, aside from I've, I've admired your work for years, uh, but getting to quote, know you here, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's funny because the earlier portion of your work, the woodcuts, et cetera, are so explicitly Jewish, meaning de delving into Jewish texts and using text as part of it, which you share also with Laurie Wall in terms of making the text part of um, the, uh, not only the Jewishness of it, but also the image. But then your work getting much more personal, it's interesting, you said something really so revealing, and I think it's something we need to hear, that your work, the Jewishness of the later work that you've shown anyway, uh, is not apparent by the image, uh, because uh, everybody has mothers, everybody has, has, has uh, events in their life, they're deeply personal, but when you suddenly give them titles that link into Tanakh, that then spins it in a way that is not only essential to the work, but actually, uh, I mean, uh, to me, it is enormously important to know the title of the work and if you're privileged to know the background of the work because, quote, that's the subject matter. You're, a pa you're not only a wonderful painter, but you're also you're painting subject matter and the, the, what you put into it is deeply Jewish. It's very clear, everything you say, your Judaism is so sitting there in your consciousness, even if it's not superficially, uh, 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 obvious in the work, the minute you get the title in there, it clicks in. I think we all need to hear that, that naming works, titles of works. I mean, I guess some people, they don't care, but to, to me, it is enormously important. And so I, I laud you for that and that work. Um, just quite, quite amazing. I just wanted to, to, to say something about um, this, this an interesting thing was appearing to me. So Lori's, so all the, the three of you are so distinct geographically and it's fascinating. Um, so Ellen, your work is so about nature, you're a city girl. It's, it's, it, it, it's just, it, it's so, what, and you know, it's somehow I'm stuck up in, I'm stuck up in, in rural Massachusetts right now because I'm sheltering, right, from New York City. I'm a real, so suddenly this connection with geography and where we are seems to scream out to me about all three of your works. So Laurie's work, something about the tactile nature of it, also, again, another city girl, so you're, you're in New York, uh, but you're the, 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 suddenly the place of the work really seems to matter. And then Ruth, your work is, is, is just, 
I, 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 what can I say? It's fascinating, but it's also fascinating as to where you are. You are in northwestern Georgia. So I looked you up on the, on, on the Google Maps, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, what is this person making talasim, right? A very, very Jewish thing with, with very, very sensual fabrics, but you're kind of, as it were, almost, you're not near too many Jews. Well, I guess you're probably closer than I think, because I see where you are. You're, bet you're not that far from Atlanta, which has a major Jewish community, and I'm assuming that might very well be your synagogue. Uh, and also, you're somewhat south of a place called Rome, Georgia. And that struck a personal note because back in the 70s, I did some uh, mural restoration in Rome, Georgia. Who would forget the name Rome, Georgia, right? <laughs> a anyway, it was just a thrill to see everyone's the, 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 both the similarities between the three artists and how each of you are, in your ways, making your work deeply Jewish. Uh, sometimes explicitly, more like Laurie's work, using, using our ritual uh, services to make it Jewish. Um, Ruth, because of the thing that you're making, and Ellen, because of the subject, but it's, but it, it is, it, by, by linking it back into Nach. Well, anyway, yesha to all three of you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Did any of the artists want to respond to Richard, or do we move on to the next question? <laughs> No, thank you, that's all. Okay. <laughs> all right, uh, Jonatas, did you have a question or were you just... Um... Yeah, I'm literally oh, okay. raising my hand because oh, I don't okay. know where to press. <laughs> okay, because the, the thing you did was actually waving the hands. <laughs> so yes. I wasn't sure if you were waving or... All right, go Both. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, thank you so much for the wonderful artists. Uh, Ellen, your work uh, is magnificent in, in every possible way. I'm a, I'm a painter myself, and I also am a printmaker. And uh, every now and then, whenever I have to go into printmaking, uh, it saddens me. But I usually also go because of, uh, let's say, uh, practical reasons. Uh, ran out of space, uh, don't have much time. Uh, anyways, my question is this. As you probably know, most painters, when they go into printmaking, they go into monoprinting. How come you chose woodcut? I first did go into mono printing. <laughs> All right. I, in fact, I have one hanging over here right now. But I just, but then I went into woodcut just on a whim. Okay. So I decided to take a class, and then I, I love the the carving into the wood, and yeah. it was something that I could do very easily. I mean, the printing part, I had to, I had to have a separate place to do that, but right. the carving, I could just take that with me anywhere. So it was That's very. Right. Neat. But it, the carving into the wood is really something. It's a yeah. great experience. And you go, you go this way, right? Not this way. Oh, no, right in the hand. Oh. Here. You want to see the cut? I had a Quentin Tarantino moment once, so. I can't do this. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, it's now open to questions for all the artists. But I do have a question for Alan. Alan, is it possible that you started the wood cutting trend in Chicago? Because I, you, I think you did it a little earlier than, uh, so I've now seen woodcuts by Gabriela Boros, by Judith Joseph, who are all like in your neighborhood. Were, were you like the first one to get it uh, started? Um, you know, I, I probably was doing it at that time before them, but because it's got such a tradition, I mean, woodcut has been around for, I, I don't want to say that I was like the first. We, we, we used to belong to a critique group together. And we would sometimes bring in different things. And there was one time I brought to the critique group little pieces of wood and my tools and everybody got a chance to do something. But I have to say that both of them have gone, I mean, they're, they're, they're both creating such beautiful work of their own that it really has nothing to do with whatever, you know, I did. They're, they own it in their own very, very special ways. So. It's true, they have a very different style than yours, but I love it that you started this whole woodcut, you know, trend in Chicago. No, I don't do it anymore. <laughs> anyway, I don't see any other raised hands. If anybody has a question or a comment, please um, do the raised hands thing in the participants window. 
Um, also, all three participants, um, if you didn't have a chance to look at the chat, I will send the chat to you later because people made a lot of comments in the chat box. Um, and is there anybody else? No, I don't see any other raised hands. So I want to first of all thank all three of you. It's been phenomenal, really, really great. I knew I was sort of familiar with Laurie's and Alan's work, but still you showed so much more. Uh, and I'm really glad I got to see Ruth's work uh, for the first time. And, and Ruth, by the way, I loved your, what you called your watercolor, uh, Tali. I'm like, we have seen such unusual techniques lately. I mean, that is not really unusual. Like, and, and then you talked about you have to use ice with something. I'm like, what are we even talking about? I have to replay the video to really follow it because it was also new to me. So I, I loved learning about the whole process. Um, so I wanted to let you know about next week's presentation. It's going to be Jada Art, which is the art groups that has been, uh, it's one of the two art groups that has been co-sponsoring these series. I would love for Jonathan, instead of me saying what it's going to be, I would love for Jonathan to just say like a, you know, a few words about it. Jonathan, please tell us about the presentation next week with you and Dana. Sure. So there, there will be uh, a few different angles. Uh, we'll talk about our personal works uh, and how it deals specifically uh, with what's going on right now and also with the matter modern uh, sentiment that, that we believe is, is rising uh, at this very moment uh, and how that deals with uh, Jewish arts and uh, uh, specifically the moments that we're going through right now. Great. Um, on that note, we're going to end this meeting. Thank you all so very much for presenting and participating and hope to see you next week at one o'clock for Jada. Thank you all.